Hello everyone, I'm Nathan P. Butler. This is my vlog, The Voice of Reason, or Lack Thereof. It is a Star Wars-focused vlog most of the time. It is this time, but this time I want to kind of circle back to something that was posted in a review recently. Uh, I do have a review of Rogue One coming very soon in the near future. Consider this sort of the warm-up thought process for this uh, as I sit here today. You'll probably see the same clothes uh, because I'll probably record that same one this evening. But... Very recently, I posted a review that I knew was going to get people pissed off at times uh, of the game Star Wars Destiny. Star Wars Destiny is a new game for Fantasy Flight Games, uh, which is a company that I have been very positive on in the past. And it's a game that uses cards and dice. And they've changed up their game model from being something that I think of as consumer-friendly to being something that is more of a traditional uh, collectible-slash-customizable-slash-trading-card game model, something more akin to... Magic the Gathering, the Star Wars CCG, and so on. And a lot of people, uh, seemingly in some cases with sort of a reflexive defense of that model, and in many cases not seeming to actually listen to what I'm actually saying in the review, have taken to posting some pretty long, in some cases, and often profanity-laced posts or comments uh, in the comment section for those videos. Now, I know... I shouldn't really be surprised by that. Usually YouTube comment sections are basically cesspools, depending on what the topic is. Sometimes uh, they really make you want to possibly quit the Internet completely because it just shows you how horrible humanity can be. But I found that usually the comment sections on the videos that I post, for the most part, tend to be fairly rational discussions. So to see it kind of devolve where you have a handful of people who can't seem to express an opinion without then turning around and saying, you know, because you have this opinion different than me, F you, F this, F that, F this game, F these people, and so on and so on and so on, um, who aren't really using, you know, the profanity to enhance an argument or emphasize a point, but are just going basically into a tirade of, here's the profanity, F this, F that, etc., etc., and oh, by the way, here's some ad hominem attacks, your mother, this, you're a this, you're a that kind of stuff. And I know that tends to sometimes be the norm for YouTube comment sections, but since it's not usually for mine, I thought that I would take some of the more common incorrect comments or uh, critiques, in some cases, valid or not, in those cases, and give you kind of a rundown here of an initial response to a lot of these arguments that are being made or a lot of these things that are being said that don't necessarily hold water, in my opinion, in most cases. So let's take a look. Now, the gist of what I said in that review thing, I did a review of the Ray starter, I did a review of the Kylo Ren starter, then I did a separate video all kind of connected together, but that separate video basically said that I am not a fan of the collectible card game model, the blind booster pack, gotta catch them all kind of model that Fantasy Flight Games is using for Star Wars Destiny, and in particular, that it's a drastic change of pace that I don't like coming from Fantasy Flight Games, who has been usually very consumer-friendly. Lots of people going ape shit over it. So let's attempt to uh, add some clarity here. Um, first thing that I hear a few times in comments, and bear in mind if yours is one of the profanity-laced ones, if all you're doing is ad hominem attacks, you're not actually trying to debate a point, your comment's not going to be seen. It'll be gone. So, you know, have fun, I guess. You know, I hope you feel better. You might take your meds and keep going. Um... But the first thing was, I bet you've never even played a CCG or a TCG. If you don't like this kind of game model, I bet you never have. Okay, well, again, must not have watched the whole video. Um, within the video, I talk about and mention the fact that I played, among other things, I played, going back to the Decipher CCG, uh, Star Wars card games for quite a while. Uh, the Star Wars CCG from Decipher was something I played, I think I played it through at least... I played it through Jabba's Palace. I want to say, I know that I got the first anthology box. I think I stopped right before the first Reflections set, and that gives you a sense of what I played. But everything from the Black Border premiere all the way up to that, I was spending all kinds of money on, like, the, you know, Black Border, Han Solo, uh, Luke Skywalker, Leia, and all the original ones from that first set, and then hunting down all the ones for the Jedi training and the, the things you needed to blow up the Death Star and, and all that kind of stuff. I had pretty much all of the cards minus a small, small number, I think it was less than 10, out of the first several sets. I forget exactly how many it was. It's up to Jabba's Palace, basically. Lots and lots of cards. 
sold them off years later for a decent amount, uh, even after the popularity had gone down a bit. But, yeah, played that. Played some Magic the Gathering, a little bit of Pokemon, but the less said about Pokemon, the better. <sighs> um, so, yeah, I've been playing those for a while. You want to take it to the next step when it comes to being immersed in that sort of gaming world. Um, when Decipher lost the Star Wars CCG license, they used those same mechanics to set up a new game entitled Wars as a five-faction game. She, Quay, Earthers, Gonjin, which is Mars, and Mavericks. Okay? Um, within the last decade, I forget exactly the year, but within the last decade, I was actually hired and brought in to write two official stories uh, novellas for that universe as part of the Wars the Battle of Phobos novella series to sort of revitalize that franchise now that the game itself is over with. So I've had to be seeped in this kind of stuff. That was actually where I wound up in a position of being sort of the collector side of this stuff because these games are designed and sometimes marketed as collectible but also for the gameplay and for the customization. And I did a lot of customization and picking up a lot of the rarer cards and whatnot, usually at pretty high prices, for the CCG for Star Wars. By the time I got to Wars, most people weren't playing Wars anymore, so that was more of the collecting side of things. And in that case, I was doing research for writing those two books. And I picked up the RPG books, what few that existed from Mongoose Publishing, and they decided that instead of having just PDF copies of all the different cards, I wanted both of the card sets from that game, every single card, no exceptions. So I bought all the starters, and I went and bought, I want to say by the time it was done, it was something like five booster packs per set, something like that. It was like about 10 to 12 booster packs total, or booster boxes, excuse me, total off of eBay, unopened booster boxes. And you know what? I still didn't have a full set of either of them. Close! but not a full set after buying 10 to 12 total booster boxes. At which time, the only option that I had was to reach out to other fans, other players, none of them around here. So in that case, I wound up uh, getting fortunate because I happened to be on an interview where I was talking about those books and mentioned that I was trying to get the cards and still had a couple I was missing, and a couple of people who were fans of the books helped me get my hands on those couple of cards that I was missing. Um, but I've been on the player side, the player spending a lot of money to get rare cards for stronger decks side, and the collectible side of the CCG, TCG kind of market. So, I bet you've never even played is a bullshit argument. Um, you just don't understand how money and business and stuff works. That's a funny one, given the fact that my day job is that I am, among other things, an economics teacher. Yeah, economics teacher, uh, I've taught economics for years. I have been a supplemental economics instructor at the college level as well. Yeah, I know economics. thing about it, though, is that usually when people say that, what they mean is you just don't get the idea that companies need to make a profit, which is not the whole picture. You need to be looking at these. If you're going to do an economic analysis, you need to look at it from a perspective of the business and the consumer the interaction in between, and other possibilities, opportunity costs you might call them, other opportunities for different models that are pushed aside to go with the model that is chosen and why that model was chosen. We'll come back to that and, and the numbers here uh, as sort of a wrap-up to all of this. Uh, next one. That's just how these types of games work. Why, yes. Yes, it is. The collectible card game model, or the CCG, TCG model, of saying, hey, here's blind boosters, buy them, hope to get the cards that you need, good frickin' luck collecting them, we're going to manage the rarity of cards to make it even harder to get than just regular randomness, that is indeed the standard model for that business. I never said it wasn't. In fact, I believe I said that it was. But just because something is the standard, just because something is the norm, doesn't make it consumer-friendly. It doesn't make it something that matches a track record of consumer-friendly business practices. All that that means is that they found a business model where they're able to make enough profit to keep the project going with enough profitability that they're not going to choose something else that will make them more profit in the long run. They found an equilibrium point in the market where there are enough people buying and enough people trying to sell or enough uh, supply out there 
from that producer that there's not a supply uh, shortage or surplus. Good for you. That still doesn't mean that it's consumer friendly. It is a business model that is typical. That's all that that means. One of my favorites, fine. If you don't like it, then you just shouldn't buy it, and you just shouldn't play it. Right. I guess they missed the part where I said that I wasn't going to be buying any more of it or playing it outside of those starter sets because I'm not a fan of that business model. So it's nice to know the people who are watching are getting angry and then basically telling me to do what I'm already doing. Uh, I like the comparison here. Yeah? Well, you shouldn't gripe about the cost of a collectible card game. If you want to play X-Wing, one ship costs... And this asshat said it was, what, 20 bucks, 30 bucks for a ship. Um, the basic X-Wing ship is 15 bucks. But even if you were going to make the comparison to the absolute cheapest version of anything from X-Wing that's an actual ship, that's still kind of missing the point. Again, economics, business. It is a lot different from a production cost side to produce cards or cards and dice, even nice ones like the ones in Destiny, versus the models used and the miniatures used for something like an X-Wing, an Imperial Assault, an Armada, etc., etc. Um, you can't expect there to be a comparison, and for those who are saying, you're comparing apples and oranges to be comparing this model to an LCG... Well, that's an apples and oranges comparison trying to be made. You're going to say that from a price standpoint, you shouldn't gripe based on the way that the prices work for a miniatures game versus a card game. Production costs are completely different. Um, I'm being told that I'm apparently telling other people not to buy Destiny. No, that wasn't in there either. I said I'm not going to. I said those who like that type of model will find it good to play and like the way that it's all being produced and sold. I don't. I understand that the natural thing in the Internet these days is just to assume that because somebody's giving you their opinion that they're telling you what to think, but that's not actually what expressing an opinion, you know, is. Expressing an opinion is just that. You shouldn't gripe about the cost. Don't you know there are already people out there who are selling full sets of Destiny for like $300? You could buy it that way. I like the don't you already know because, again, that's something that was mentioned in the actual video that people were bitching about. Yeah, already said it. And yes, that's actually a cool thing that those people are doing, and I noted that if you want to do that, it is still, and we'll see this in the numbers here in a moment, it is still actually more cost-effective to buy it as a complete set from something like Team Covenant than it is to try to get them with the blind booster packs. Absolutely. I don't know why you're saying that what people buy will decide whether the game is balanced or not. What? Different cards might be able to be balanced. Someone who has a large repertoire of cards or a large collection of cards may be able to be balanced with somebody else who does. But somebody who's playing with a starter and a handful of boosters where they didn't happen to get lucky versus someone who's bought quite a few who's gotten really, really lucky on certain cards... That's not going to be a balanced game. There's a level of skill balancing, sure, and good skill can compensate for bad cards or bad dice. But to say that balance exists in a game that is designed to be inherently imbalanced to cause you to go out and buy more boosters to make a stronger set of cards to play with doesn't really make logical sense. And then my favorite, which goes back to the whole you don't understand how this stuff works, uh, which is, <laughs> seriously? You're not supposed to collect these. They're game stuff. You don't collect these types of card games. Well, okay. Let's rewind. Typically, no. That is not what people will do. Unless you're talking about something like Pokemon, and even then, that was the marketing thing more for the games than it was for the card game, and people still kind of played in that whole catch em all type thing. There will always be people trying to get full sets of card games, but it's certainly not the norm for people to try to get them. But most card games are not marketed as collect, collect, collect. They're marketed as here's a new booster, go out and play. Uh, be tournament ready, perhaps. That type of thing. It's all about the gameplay and what kind of new cool things are being inserted into the game with these new cards that you're getting. But it's not go out and get them all. The push from Fantasy Flight Games with this game has been really heavy more than it needed to be, really, 
but really heavy on this idea of collect, 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 collectible. Go get them all, you can get them, etc., etc., and here's how to do it with the booster packs and such. Probably because they are moving from more consumer-friendly models to the CCG, TCG model. They're trying to emphasize the fact that this is not something where you just get everything in one box. You will be picking up boosters. And they're calling that collectible rather than customizable or a trading card game. And that's fine. But they're in doing so, they're overemphasizing this collectible aspect of it. If someone is going to try to collect this game, and that is where I said the issue lies in the review, in the opinion piece, if someone is going to try to collect this game, not just play it, then it is a really bad, difficult model for them to do that with. That is where the issue lies. I am a completist. I mentioned that within the, the uh, review stuff. That's just me. I would love to get a full set of anything that I'm going to try to collect any of. There are other people who are like that. They are pushing towards that market that collect, 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 but they don't have a model here that is friendly to doing that. So, yeah, most people won't try to collect them all when it comes to a set like Star Wars Destiny, but they are pushing it as if that is a segment of the market they want to capture with this product, but they've got a model that isn't friendly to that consumer base. All right, so that said, let's do a little bit of elaboration here, okay? So this is the Awakenings list. It's called call a card list. You have it divided up. It's color-coded so you can tell what is a starter card, a common card, an uncommon card, a rare card, or a legendary card. It tells you which cards come with die, which ones are unique so they can only be one uh, when you're playing with it as opposed to two. Two is the limit uh, for any other type of card. And they just lay it all out here, all nice, numbered, and everything, so you can check off what you do and don't have. Again, collecting as the reason to put this in the box. So, um, the, what they've said basically is that a booster, is, which runs about $2.99, $2.59 through Miniature Market, that's where I get most of my stuff, um, a booster pack is going to have three common cards in it, one uncommon, and then one rare or legendary. Legendaries are more rare than rare, and the legendaries, they say, are going to be one for every six booster packs. And from what we're seeing with places that have opened up a whole bunch of boosters and done the comparison and run the numbers, it looks like they're actually sticking to that number very well. So we'll let them have the one in six ratio here and assume that that's correct, that it's not less than that. So that means, though, that to get one legendary card, you're expected to have to buy six booster packs to wind up running across one, okay? How many legendary cards are there? There are 17 legendary cards. The other thing I pointed out is something that bugged me about this was that to get the full impact out of a legendary card that you find, or any of the hero cards that you find, depending on which hero's legendary rare that you're getting, uh, you may have to find it twice, get lucky twice, because a lot of the hero cards have a cost you can use to play with it with one die or with two dice, but to get a second die, you have to find it again in a pack. And there's only going to be one card that has a die in every booster pack. So, that said, how many of these require two? Of the 17 legendary cards, there are six. Phasma, Vader, Jabba, Poe, Luke, and Han that are characters who have two heroes or villains, that have two dice available, even though they only come with one in the pack. So if we're going to have to find two of each of those, then we got to add another six legendaries to what we're going to need to get lucky and find. So 17 plus 6, that is 23 legendaries. In order to get the 23 legendaries for this game so that you can have all the cards and play with those legendary heroes at their fullest with two dice each, we're going to need to buy... 23 times 6, or 138 booster packs, and have our luck be perfect. This is not talking about rare, common, uncommon. We're going to assume that you're going to run into those as you're trying to get the legendaries. But 138 booster packs, bare minimum, with perfect luck, to be able to get all those legendaries plus the duplicates of the 6 that can go with 2 dice. All right? What is that going to run you? Well, a booster box is 36 packs, okay? and you need 138, which means you need 3.83 booster boxes, or four booster boxes, or you could just buy three booster boxes 
and buy 30 of the booster packs separately. Either way. What's that going to run you? Again, with perfect luck. Well, if we go with the booster box prices at Miniature Market, which is $89.99 for a booster box of 36 boosters, that's going to run you $359.96. If instead you buy them as separate booster packs, maybe a little bit at a time, uh, that is going to run you at regular retail price of $299, $412.62. Or, if you buy it at the Miniature Market price of $259, you're looking at $357.42. Or, just going by miniature market prices, because they are a little cheaper, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt here. If you buy the three booster boxes to get 108 booster packs, and then buy 30 separately at the miniature market discounted price, you're looking at $347.67. Or you can buy a full set through someone like Team Covenant that is tending to sell full sets for approximately $300. So, anyone who wants to actually collect them all is going to have to spend a hell of a lot of money to get them and get incredibly lucky because every time that you miss one of those legendaries then we're going to have to assume another six booster packs in order to have another chance to get a legendary to fill the slot of the legendary you accidentally wound up having duplicated previously um it is a huge huge money sink now you compare this to something like the LCG model, the living card game model from Fantasy Flight Games, where they put out cards where you have a box set or a small box, whatever it might be, where it's the exact same cards in each one. There's no blind boosters. You buy it, you know exactly what you're getting. These, we'll use the smallest ones, the force packs. A force pack tends to run $15. You get five objective sets in there, approximately. You don't have to do any hunting for buying extra copies of it, because if it's one that you can have two of in your deck, your objective deck, instead of having only one copy of that objective set, which is rare, uh, they give you an extra copy of each one that could have two. So you don't have to worry about that at all. So you got five objective sets, right, of six cards each, not counting the duplicates, so that's 30 cards, right? And that's about 15 bucks, right? Which is a little higher price-wise than, say, a 15-card blind booster pack for three bucks of, say, Magic the Gathering. One set one cycle of force packs is six of those so we're looking at 180 cards again we could include the duplicates and that's going to run you somewhere over 300 cards depending on how many of the objective sets are limited to one per objective deck so they only give you one um and these tend to run again 15 bucks or so per force pack so 90 bucks but you got the entire set and again that was 180 cards yes Awakenings, 174, a comparable number here, okay? You've got 90 bucks versus 300 plus. Even if you're perfectly lucky and use the absolute most cost-effective way of buying a full set of Awakenings for Destiny, you're still going to wind up paying three times or more what you would pay for a comparable amount of new cards for the LCG, a full cycle. Though again, that cost then continues to spiral because of the blind booster pack aspect and the fact that most people aren't going to have perfect luck. Now, for someone who has played CCGs, TCGs before, this is the norm. It's what you expect. You don't expect people to necessarily buy full sets, but some people will try to, especially when the company is pushing it, like Fantasy Flight is. But the, the costs just get out of control. Now, I would note here, though, as a mitigating factor, you do have the cost of the production of those dice. So probably figure that you're actually looking at more like maybe a couple times rather than three times price-wise, because if you tried to, to look into the cost of the dice, put them in with the cost of the cards, you could start to ramp up the cost of the force packs, blah, blah, blah. But suffice to say, it gets expensive, and there are cheaper models in which to do it. Now, this was Magic the Gathering, or Pokemon, or Yu-Gi-Oh!, or whatever. Anything like that, where this has always been the model, if it was Decipher putting it out, or Wizards of the Coast putting it out, like they did with Star Wars material, I wouldn't be griping about it. I wouldn't be criticizing the company for it. But, this is Fantasy Flight Games. 
Fantasy Flight has had a tendency to be very consumer friendly in its business models. Uh, you get a product that has something missing or something damaged in it. Unless it's the big piece of it, like the miniature, for instance, then they'll tell you to take it back to the store you got it from. But if it's like, I'm missing a token, I'm missing this or that, usually they will simply send it to you in the mail and replace it for free, no hassle whatsoever. Uh, when it comes to Imperial Assault, right, they put out the big sets and alongside the big sets, the small ally and villain packs that you can pick up. And all the ones released alongside the big sets, not the ones released in the odd intervals, and there's only been a handful of those, but all the ones released alongside a big set, the big set includes the deployment cards you need to play as a given character plus a token for it if they're going to show up in an ally or villain pack. So you don't have to buy the ally or villain pack to play as that character. It's already in the box. It's just if you want a miniature instead of a token and some extra game material that you actually buy the ally or villain pack. Okay. And, of course, then... You get the living card game model, which is the whole biggest point of comparison here, which, of course, is a game where what you buy, you know exactly what you're going to get every time. There are no blind booster packs. Every pack is identical to anything else with that same name, etc., etc. This is a company that I and many other reviewers of much greater stature than me have praised like mad over the years for how great their consumer-friendly model of business has been. They have now chosen to move to a different model for this game, perhaps overemphasizing the collectible aspect in part of emphasizing how the model has changed. And in moving to this model, they've moved to a model that, yes, may be the norm, but is not necessarily consumer-friendly. It is something that is a source for frustration. It is something that is a source for spending a lot of money. It drives sales, not by the quality of the product and putting out more of the product, like more force packs, for instance, or more miniatures or whatever. It drives it based on the same a primal urge that gives way to gambling, because that's essentially what you're doing, right? I'm spending my three bucks to buy a booster pack, and I'm gambling that there'll be some card in there I need. Hopefully, I'll hit the jackpot, and it'll be the legendary that I need, and so on and so on. Uh, it, it builds into that desire that it's not, well, I got this product. I'd like to see what they come out next time that's new, and I'll pick up that new thing. It's, I just got this, and I don't have quite what I need. Man, just one more pack. Just one more pack. It's the equivalent from a, a consumer gamer purchasing standpoint of what? Crack? Or let, let's be nicer, of Pringles? Of Lay's potato chips, right? You, once you pop, you can't stop. Bet you can't eat just one. Bet you can't just buy one booster pack. Again, a viable business model, it's actually probably more profitable than doing something like an LCG because you don't have to keep producing new cards to drive sales it's that need to have them, need to collect, need to get these cards that winds up driving the sales. It's a perfectly valid business model. It's just not as good for consumers, or particularly good for consumers in general, as many of the other models that Fantasy Flight has gone with. And when a company takes a drastic change of course, experiments with something, and highlights this as an experiment of doing something new in their news bites and whatnot, then yes, that makes them open to analysis, to critique, to people like me sitting back and looking at this business model compared to their previous practices to say whether or not it seems like a good fit for that company, a good fit for that market, a good fit for the consumer. And I understand there are a lot of people out there who are not completionists, who are not put off by this business model. Heck, that would have been me 20 years ago not being put off by this model. But at this point, especially when dealing with Fantasy Flight games, I'm put off by it. But you know what? I understand that people are going to be bothered because my opinion deviates from theirs. But see, here's the thing. When it's a review or an opinion piece, it's the opinion of the person doing the review or opinion piece. Duh. If you just want to hear your own opinion parroted back, with or without critical thinking, then do your own damn review. I'm not going to throw rational thought out the window, and no reviewer should throw rational thought out the window and ignore economics, ignore basic math, and ignore what is or is not consumer-friendly within light of a company's history, simply because some people will wind up getting butthurt or pissy because they expected to have their opinion parroted back to them, and oh my god, they face someone who's actually giving an honest opinion that differs from theirs. As I said, 
I will not be picking up more products aside from starters for Destiny. My choice, because in my opinion, the business model isn't good. The business model isn't consumer friendly, even if it's good for the company's bottom line. That doesn't mean shit for what you should think about the game or whether you should buy the game. And I would absolutely welcome rational arguments to counter these rational arguments. But if you're just going to sit there and say, I can't believe he doesn't agree with my opinion. He must not play these games. What a moron. He doesn't understand business. Da, 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 and then start dropping F-bombs because you can't quite figure out the words to say. Damn, dude. Go home. Go to sleep. Take your meds. I get it's the internet age, but there is such a thing still as civil discourse and rational debate. Think about it. 